We have to figure out why we get to this place to begin with. Soul Care is, is a book that focuses on the six rhythms that Jesus himself practiced to care for his soul. But I don't think we can just dive into the rhythms without getting to the root of the why. Why am I constantly in a burnout cycle? What, do I, what am I believing that's causing me to remain here and live this way? Because if we don't get to the root of why we do what we do to begin with, you can practice these six rhythms and you're gonna default back to your old ways within a couple weeks if you don't get to the roots. So we actually really need to kind of start with the roots. Maybe you feel spread too thin. Maybe uh, you've said a phrase like, there's just too much on my plate. <laughs> I'm running out of bandwidth. I'm burnt out. I'm exhausted. Well, uh, today's author, we're excited to talk to Deborah Thaletta, and she reels life-giving rhythms Jesus modeled as he helps readers break free from burnout, culture, and rising anxiety. The book is called Soul Care, and um, find life-giving rhythms, avoid burnout, discover unspeakable joy. I like that one. <laughs> uh, and live restored. Well, tell us about the inspiration behind the book, Deborah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a licensed counselor and I'm dealing with mental health and emotional health, uh, breakdowns all the time, people struggling. Uh, but I really believe that the prelude or the preventative maintenance to mental health struggles is often found in our ability to soul care, to care for ourselves, to make sure that we're filled up in order to pour out. And, you know, the Bible talks a lot about being filled, but why is it that so many of us in the church, specifically as Christians, don't feel that way? Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of where the conversation began. So you say when we get in our car, and look at where our gas tank is at. You should. We should ask ourselves the same question. Yeah, in some ways, you know, I I always joke that could there be a correlation between our gas tank filling styles and our emotional filling styles? I don't know, but what I do know is I'm a quarter tank girl. Like once it mm. gets down <laughs> to the quarter tank mark, it's time to fill up. Whereas someone like my husband can kind of roll in on fumes, which he has done before. And so we kind of joke, is there a correlation? I wish there was a gauge on our body to tell us, hey, you're nearing empty. But even though there's not a physical gauge, there are symptoms that our body sends us. There are signals that we can be on the lookout for that let us know if we're nearing that point of empty. You know, my wife is a quarter tank person yeah. and I'm more like your husband. And she thinks that what I'm doing is wrong. It's even a sin. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is annoying to get in the car, turn it on and the gas light turns on. It's like, come on, who well, had this car that. before? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> there is that. So mm. what is the key to living filled? Well, first of all, I think we need to be aware of the signals of when we're feeling empty. Mm. Let's start there. You know, okay. when, when your body starts to send you signals of fatigue, exhaustion, difficulty concentrating, starting to feel jaded, you're starting to feel irritable. I, I think we have the most tension in our relationships when we're feeling empty. Like things start to really get magnified in irritability and frustrations and all of these things. You know, maybe you go into work on a Monday and you're like, I really don't want to be here, you know, mm -hmm. where it's something that you typically love doing. So you want to start looking for the signs of burnout. And then when you see them honoring your body rather than judging it, like if, if, if all the ga if all the lights go off on your dash on your car, you don't just judge the car like this, this lousy car, why can't it get me where I need to go? You pull aside <laughs> and you take care of it. But oftentimes we just judge ourselves. Why, what's wrong with me? Why do I feel so tired? Why am I so unmotivated? And we just judge ourselves and feel bad. And then we just push through instead of responding. 
So, so I think it starts with recognizing the signals, but then I also think we have to figure out why we get to this place to begin with. Soul Care is, is a book that focuses on the six rhythms that Jesus himself practiced to care for his soul. But I don't think we can just dive into the rhythms without getting to the root of the why. Why am I constantly in a burnout cycle? What, do I, what am I believing that's causing me to remain here and live this way? Because if we don't get to the root of why we do what we do to begin with, you can practice these six rhythms and you're going to default back to your old ways within a couple weeks if you don't get to the roots. So we actually really need to kind of start with the roots. Uh, it sounds like you're saying it's my fault. Well, <laughs> in a way, I, I like to use the word ownership and responsibility versus there you fault. Go. Doesn't that sound better? That sounds so yes. much better. Oh, that's but yeah, what I'm it kind of is myself. your fault. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. It's totally my fault. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, well, and you, you just addressed this, that the principles of soul care are backed up by scripture. Real quick, though, uh, I think that there could be some confusion here because we you hear the term self-care so often. Right. Mm -hmm. What is the difference before we delve into this other? What's the difference between self-care and soul care? Well, it's a really good question. And I think a lot of Christians actually have an aversion to the word self-care because it feels mm -hmm. wrong. It feels selfish. It's like we're not supposed to focus on self. And here's what I believe to be true. I think self-care is a superficial means to an end. Self-care focuses on a pain point and it's like, how, what's the quick fix? You know, I'm going to go get a massage. I'm going to go get a manicure or pedicure. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Well, those are all helpful and they might make you feel good for a moment, but are they actually getting to the root of burnout? Mm. Are they actually filling you up so that you no longer need these quick fixes? I think soul care is different because soul care focuses on long lasting change rather than quick fixes. It keeps mm. you filled rather than, okay, I just, I'm, I just need something quick. And so I think that's the difference. And I, I really believe that it is biblical, which we'll go into. Um, but I also think it's pretty legitimate why people struggle with this. I think, number one, they have a lot of theological hangups, which we'll talk about. You know, they weren't taught that soul care was right or good. They feel like it's wrong. And then family of origin. We carry roles from childhood that we still live out of today. You guys will find this really interesting on my podcast. Talk to me. I have this um, series that I'm doing called soul care where people are calling in to talk about it, rhythms that they've really struggled with. And so we we're trying to dig in why not before I help you fix this, let's figure out why you've struggled with this to begin with. Mm -hmm. And three personality types came up to the surface of people who struggle the most with soul care. The first were the firstborns. I'm curious if any of you guys check off these boxes. Okay, we got one firstborn in the house. Sally. The firstborns because they are overly responsible. They tend to be parent pleasers, which then eventually turns into people pleasers. They tend to see the gaps and fill them in. Like, oh, there's a gap. I can I can fill in. I can do that. And, and so that overarching responsibility tends to put the needs of others first and their needs kind of get put on the back burner. The second type were people who came from a chaotic home where somebody else in the house had louder needs than them. Maybe it was mm. a, a sibling with a disability. Maybe it was a dysfunctional parent or a rebellious sibling, or maybe mom and dad were fighting all the time. In some way, shape, or form, that child saw, whoa, there's some big stuff going on here, bigger needs than mine. So what do I do with my needs? It's like, well, I'm just going to kind of take my needs a couple notches down because everybody else has bigger needs than me. And then the third personality type were people who either mom or dad or both were emotionally unavailable or disconnected. A lot of the radio, a lot of the, the callers that called into the show said, mom was frazzled. 
mom was overwhelmed or dad was unavailable, emotionally absent, workaholic, ministryaholic, alcoholic, whatever it is. So imagine this child with needs. Do I go to mom with my needs? No, she's really stressed and overwhelmed, so I'm not going to go there. What about dad? No, he's not really available, so what am I going to do? I'm just going to make light of my needs. And when you mm. grow up with one, two, three of those check boxes, you have a much harder time identifying your needs and then doing something about it. So this is what I mean about getting to the root of our why. Where does this come from? What are the belief systems that shaped us into being people who function in this way? And then how do we begin to rewrite those patterns and align them to God's truth instead of our trauma? You know, one of those Ooh. that you described is my son. Mm -hmm. Because we uh, have a daughter diagnosed with multiple special needs. Mm. And uh, I could tell by his personality, he tamps down his needs. Yeah. Um, I don't know if things are going to change now. Uh, our daughter passed away in June. Mm, I'm um, sorry to hear that. I appreciate that. But uh, yeah, I can see that in his personality. He's like, mm -hmm. well, you guys have got bigger fish to fry. I know. And he kind of knocks his own needs down. I know. <laughs> and even though nobody told him, in fact, if you could speak to him right here, right now, you would say, that's not what we want for you. Yeah. No, we don't. Want right. That. But naturally you kind of look at the dynamic and decide without it. It's not even a conscious thing. It's like, okay, how do I keep equilibrium in this house? I'm not going to add stress. They've already got enough on their plate. Mm -hmm. And so even in the best families with the best intentions, the enemy sneaks in and tries to distort our view of self and our importance and our identity and all of these things and we just have to be so careful to, to make sure we're constantly realigning how we live to God's best for us. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Well, and you talked about just like family patterns that emerge. I don't know that I've ever connected my inability to take care of myself before I get to the point of breaking. But I, I was thinking as you talked, my grandma who I spent most of my time with, uh, my parents were divorced, so my mom and I lived with my grandparents, and I was home with my grandma, you know, in the afternoons and throughout the summer and all that. She ran herself ragged, hmm. and it was everybody's needs come before mine, and if I'm not taking care of other people, I'm lazy. Like, I've got to cook. I've got to clean. I've got to do this. I've got to do that, and if there's a break, nope, I can't take a break. And now I'm in a position where my husband is on disability. So I'm the one that, you know, brings in the income. And I feel like I am letting down our family if I try to take a break. Sally and I were talking about this the other day. Uh, I mean, different circumstances, but we both find ourselves apologizing if we need <laughs> something to just to like fill our tanks back up. And we're like, I'm so sorry. I need this. I'm so sorry. I need that. Yeah. And it's just so weird that we feel the need to apologize for that. Yeah. yeah. Both of us. It goes back to what you were talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And for you, it was what was modeled. It's like that belief system was front and center. Like, this is how you live your life. This is how it's mm -hmm. supposed to be done. This is where you get your value by doing for others. And if you stop doing for others, then you're lazy, you're not doing enough, something is wrong, you're not offering something that you should be offering. So it becomes a value thing without us even realizing it. And, and hmm. so it's like, okay, why do I keep cycling through this burnout loop? And how do I begin to tackle some of these underlying belief systems? Because it has to start there. We have to yeah. face those beliefs. How do we recognize, like, how can we kind of self-diagnose or rec uh, recognize burnout or even breakdown before we get to that point? Because I think I've reached that point way too many times in my life. Kind of preempt it. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's, what's weird, I find it's like sometimes I, I'm guessing I'm ignoring the symptoms because it just, it happens. And I'm like, where did this even come from? I didn't even yeah. know that it was happening. Well, we talked about some of the symptoms earlier, you know, exhaustion, fatigue, concentration issues tension in relationships, heightened irritability. But I also think another thing to be on the lookout for is our numbing devices. Mm. The empty yep. things that we go to. I always say empty things can't fill empty people. But here we are again, scrolling for hours on yep. end, 
the numbing, it's like my body's starting to feel burnout, but instead of stopping and, and recognizing, ooh, this doesn't feel good, I quickly want to make that feeling go away. Instead of saying, okay, this doesn't feel good, something's going on, maybe I should do something different. Maybe I should respond in healthy ways. Maybe I need to look at my schedule. Maybe I need to take more naps. Maybe I need to eat better, whatever. Instead of fixing it, we want to do the quick thing of numbing it. So for me, I'm, I, I like to be aware of when I find myself engaging in numbing. Let's say I'm eating more sugar than I should be or shopping more than I should be. Or scrolling more uh -oh. than I should be. Misty, how dare know, she read I both know. of our books? Oh, come on. It's like, what? She said shopping. Oh, no. She right? Said the Target sugar. app is getting way more use these days. Oh. Amazon packages, the, the delivery guy's like, hey, I'm back. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. Um, what about <laughs> alcohol, right? Mm. We're using alcohol. If you're using alcohol every day or more days yeah. than not to take you off the edge, the question should be, why are you always on the edge, right? Mm. So it could be substances. It could be porn. It could be watching way too much TV, feeling like you're unmotivated to do anything, so you're just numbing. Mm. So I think we have to be on the lookout also for those things, and an increase of those in our life is probably a sign that something's going on that we're trying to cover up. And we're pacifying ourselves. Is it because you don't want to face the real problem I think, or the issues that you're really dealing with? You know, I think it starts with even, I don't want to feel this feeling. Okay, gotcha. Like, this doesn't feel good. I don't like sure. to feel this tired, unmotivated, uh, disgruntled, irritability, tension. So I'm just going to numb it instead of see it as a signal and then go in and do some of that work, some of that maintenance. It is hard to do that work. But I always say that it the work of healing is hard, but living unhealed is harder. Because mm. you live yeah. with those burdens for a long time. And not only that, they begin to seep into the lives of everyone around you. So I think the work of healing is short term. Like, let me just do this work so I can get healthy versus the long-term, lifelong burden of carrying really unhealthy things. It's, it's a far mm. heavier burden to live on yeah. healed. I do well, feel a little just, called out. My mail, by the way, says I have six packages I, coming today. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Just going to ignore that. <laughs> oh, so powerful, right, Misty? I mean, I think... You and I, um, we have very different personalities, and yet we respond very similarly to even if somebody offers me, why don't you take that personal day? I'll say, oh, I don't need that. You know, no, you know, it's just that getting over that hump of seeing that as a weakness. Yeah. And so we continue in our burnout direction. And Okay, so I Sally, feel. do you mind if I dig a little? Why do you think you feel like we 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 figured out what's going on with misty so mm -hmm. now it's sally why do you feel that it's a weakness where do you think those belief systems came from firstborn so we already talked about that two sisters who very much needed my mom's attention when sister became um a drug addict and she passed away a couple years ago and um, so I pretty quickly learned to just find a corner wow. and be out of the way. And um, my mom is very caring. She's, I love you, mom. <laughs> um, but she's very focused on the nurturing side of helping people who need help. And so I was very sick growing up and she did a great job of taking care of me physically but when it came to my two sisters, I heard over and over again, if you will do this, Sally, then they will do that. Yeah. So it made my responsibility to find the peace yeah. for the family. And I know she didn't intend to do that. She was at her wits end. Right. Um, but that's it. Mm -hmm. So wow. I still fight with that even at this, at this age and stage. I just think it's so important for us to recognize that even in this room with people who love Jesus, mm -hmm. people who are living for Jesus, 
we all have things we need to face from our past. And we don't look back to shame those who have gone before us. Right. We look back so that we can adjust and align our belief systems for those who are to come after us. Like we have to get it right. The responsibility, like Mike mm. said earlier, is on us. And and that's really empowering. It's like Jesus has entrusted us to heal. He's mm. invited us to do it better. And when you think of it that way, instead of thinking, oh man, this is all my fault, I think, what a privilege it is to be entrusted with the gift of healing and aligning mm. my life to God's best for me. Mm -hmm. mm. I love it. I first found your podcast, Talk to Me, and uh, through the episode specific, specific. You can say it. <laughs> Coming. <laughs> specifically, <laughs> the one that I had followers, but not friends. Mm. Wow. I always just zoom. I need to go right there. You know, I love what we do on the morning show, but that just hit me between the eyes. I was like, well, how many friends, Sally, do you actually have that you call up at any moment and, you know, go do something? So why do you think with all we have going on with social media and so many other connection points, why do we feel disconnected? Well, I think you said it without saying it when we were talking about, you know, your belief systems in your childhood. And I think mm. the idea that having needs is weak. Having needs is a burden to them. Yeah. And if that's the I think the men reality, feel that way. Do they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Men, men, you can't have needs. Yeah. Huh. If that's the reality, then we're doing our relationships a disservice because in order for intimacy to happen, there has to be vulnerability. Like mm. think of it. I have needs. I, I, I trust you with them. You meet them. Then you have needs and you trust me with them and I meet them. And now we have this intimacy relationship. Wow. But if I don't have needs and you don't have needs, or if you have needs, but I don't, then it's only going one way. And we're really, mm. really struggle to connect. If there's no vulnerability, there's no real intimacy. Even Jesus had vulnerability. One of the rhythms, one of the six rhythms in soul care is the rhythm of connect. Mm -hmm. And it talks about the importance of life giving relationships, two sided relationships, give and take. And I think the thing that boggled my mind, I'll tell you guys, when I was writing soul care, it, it felt like an anointed experience. Like God just opened my eyes to things I'd never, I've read the gospel so many times, but the Lord just opened my eyes to things I had never seen before. And in, in this specific chapter, it was the vulnerability of Jesus in being so intentional to give to his friends, but also intentional to ask and to receive. Mm. Will you do this for me? Will you go into the next town and prepare the meal? Will you Stay up and pray with me. Will you? Wow. He didn't need that, but you can't have intimacy without vulnerability. And so he practiced. He showed us what it looks like. Even when Mary washed his feet, he could have been like, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that. He received it. He welcomed because he knew that was how we connect. It was just as much of a blessing for them to have the opportunity to serve him. And I think we've got a lot to learn from how Jesus did relationships and the importance of relationships that are life giving, not just life taking. I think we're really good when we're in ministry to just life taking relationships. That's what I'm made for. Here's what can I give you? What can I give you? What can I give you? But we don't have life giving relationships. And I think we need both. Yeah. Then that became your chapter titles, nourish, rest, connect, protect, and savor and tune in yeah. all came from the life of Jesus. All and the I six love that. rhythms, just looking mm -hmm. for things that Jesus practiced. You know, it was, it was incredible because a lot of these things are backed up by science, psychology, counseling, but to see them in the life of Jesus was just mm. so incredible because you, Jesus was fully God <laughs> yet fully man. And so he chose to honor his human capacity. He chose to honor it. How much more do we need to honor our human capacity? In yeah. fact, I actually felt convicted with the 
idea of pride getting in the way of, of thinking, I, I'm good. I don't have to mm. honor my capacity. I can do it all. And and to me, it takes a humility to say, no, I have limits. I need God. I need others. I need to rest. I need to honor this temple that God has given me. Mm. I need to fill Beautiful. up so that I can continue to pour out in the ways that God has called me to. Mm. That's good. I, I'm just sitting here. My mind is spinning as you're talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm trying to put two and two together, and maybe I'm off track. Does it, does it seem like if you've lost intimacy in a relationship, then maybe you've quit sharing your needs? Hmm. Uh, if you don't really need each other, you don't. I mean, maybe that's same with marriage. If, if two people are just, I'm okay, and I'm okay. Well, right. right. I would say, yeah, I would say it's an inhibitor of intimacy if you don't have any needs for, for each other, you know, you're right. Like, what's the point if I don't, what's the, why are you, why are you together Yeah, here that I need? And, um, I mean, think about even the thing that draws us to the, to Jesus (coughs) is need deep, deep need. And, and, and. So to think about that in relationship as as far as like vulnerability and and it doesn't mean like I need you to live, but I have needs for connection, validation, mm-hmm. friendship, companionship. I need to be noticed and seen. I need to be um, affirmed, uh, loved. We have we do have needs. It's just a matter Absolutely. of figuring out what those needs are. Sometimes in sessions, I'll ask you know one or the other spouse like. What needs do you have? And oftentimes the man, I, I don't like to stereotype, but the past few sessions, it's been pretty, you know, standard that usually it's the man who's like, I don't know. Yes. I don't know what my needs are. <laughs> uh, like, I could really have to think about this. Um, like, are we talking laundry? Are we talking like making lunch? Are we talking dishes? Are we like, no, no, a little bit deeper than that. What yeah. are your <laughs> deeper emotional needs i feel like men i'll just speak about myself and i point the finger at me are emotionally well that sounds mean i'll just say it this way i'm emotionally dumb <laughs> <laughs> meaning uh half the time i don't understand what's going on in the inside it takes mm-hmm. a while for me to really think and go okay that's my problem yeah i get it now but I will say you're not emotionally dumb as using your words towards <laughs> us as a team. No, you're like one of the this. first ones to notice that we're having an off day. Right. And, and I hear you saying it to us, Sally, you do okay. And then I know I better sit up straight. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's interesting. Kankel Fritz that, you know, speaking, but that doesn't reflect back on you and recognizing your emotional needs. Yeah. It's like mm. my wife will sometimes go, are you angry with me? And I'm like, no. She goes, well, notify your face. So it's like, I didn't even. <laughs> and now he says it to me. Uh, <laughs> that's a great and line. that's not a joke. <laughs> no. So, so I know it's like I kind of know something's going on, but right. kind of need a third party to go, whoa. <laughs> yeah. What's with you? You know. So the sixth rhythm in soul care is the rhythm of tuning in yeah. tune mm. in to what's going on underneath the surface of your life tune mm. into your emotions become emotionally aware and insightful and healthy proverbs 20 verse 5 says the purposes of a person's heart are like deep waters but a person of insight draws them out and we're not mm. talking about like turning on the faucet and out comes the water think about a deep well and drawing out water in ancient days was a process. It was work. It was intentionality. It was bringing down that bucket and using my strength and energy to figure this out. And emotional health is similar. I think Jesus is one of the best models of emotional health. He was so in tune to what he felt. Biblical experts have identified 39 different emotions through scripture that Jesus felt and expressed. And the Bible says if everything he did was written down, all the books in the world couldn't contain it. So we are just getting a 
a, a little glimpse of his emotions. And Jesus knew when emotions come, I need to be aware of them and then I need to respond to my emotions in healthy ways. It's not the emotions aren't bad or good. Even frustration, anger, sadness, grief, those aren't bad emotions. There's just signals. It's your body saying, pay attention. It's God mm -hmm. saying, pay attention to something. Mm -hmm. And then we have the opportunity to then take that emotion and respond in a healthy way. You know, I think of you uh, having just lost your daughter. And I think about the story of Jesus losing his best friend and feeling grief. Mm -hmm. You know, and how he wept. He didn't avoid the emotion i'm just gonna hold it together i'm gonna be strong i'm not gonna i'm not gonna cry he allowed himself to feel the depths of that feeling in front of people and then what he did next the next verse after jesus wept he looked up to heaven and gave thanks to the father to me the antidote to our grief is gratitude it's like, what do I do next? What do I do with this? I feel it. And now what? Okay, Lord, let me be grateful. Let me be grateful for who you are and what you've done, all that you're doing. Let me, let me respond to this really bad feeling with something that's going to connect me with you, to connect me with others. Even really bad feelings can create something incredible if we respond to them in healthy ways. But some people respond to their grief by numbing, drinking, yep. isolating, withdrawing, you know? So it's not the emotion. It's like, what do I do with this? How do I respond in healthy ways? Mm -hmm. And Jesus gave us such an example with sorrow, with agony, with fear, with anger, of how to then, what do I do next? And we see it all through scripture. Yeah, it's pretty empowering though that Jesus did all that. I think that in our culture, showing emotion is bad, wrong. But in fact, what do we do guys when it happens? I'm so sorry. Like I'll break down and I'll start tearing up. I apologize mm -hmm. and I'm sorry about it. Like I've sinned. <laughs> or I've done yeah. something wrong, but that's not the case. You're just being a real Interesting person. Interesting thing happened just the other day. That happened. You said, Sally, I don't want you to rescue me. Mm. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. You know, that I didn't even realize I was naturally doing that. I'm just trying right. to end it. Let's you make know? this go away as fast <laughs> as possible so that, but honestly, those are the moments that we can connect most with others and with God. I, yeah. I tend to be, I have a lot of emotions myself and sometimes in session with a client, I will even tear <laughs> up. It's hard to numb yourself to the hardships that people are walking through when you're yeah. walking with them. And it stirs up emotion in me at times. There's a side of me that's like, I don't want to be that counselor that's crying in session. <laughs> but then the other part of me is like, isn't there something about that that's withness? I yep. am with you mm. in this. I want to carry this with you. So isn't there something about that that can really connect us if we allow it to? Mm. And when they say sorry for crying, I'm like, don't apologize. I am privileged and honored to witness this and be with you in this. And that's the reality. I, I truly feel that way. And if we, can if we could just start to create that culture in – the people who are closest to us, I think well, so much healing would happen. I love that. You, uh, you made a statement. Um, empty things can't fill empty people. Talk about that. You know, we go to these things to make us feel good, like we talked about, shopping and alcohol and even good stuff, right? Even like ministry. I'm just going to work more. I feel bad. I'm burnt out. What am I going to do? I'm just going to work more. Like, how does that make any sense? You know, I'm going to serve God <laughs> even more. I'm going to get even more burnt out. Exactly. <laughs> but it doesn't work. And I think when we see people in ministry specifically who are struggling with sin or bad decisions, I would guarantee 
they're burnt out and empty. I would guarantee mm. it. I would, I, I've never met a filled person who is living dysfunctionally. Let's just put it that way. Every addict, alcoholic, porn addict, affair, everyone that walks into my office who has, is, is in the middle of an addictive behavior, not one of them would say, I feel 10 out of 10 full. Mm. Not mm. one. And, and it's because we're the most susceptible when we're empty and looking for quick fixes. And I, I think Jesus knew how much he had to pour out. So, so he knew how important it was for him to stay filled. He didn't take it lightly. One of the rhythms of soul care, another one of the rhythms is the rhythm of protect, protect, set boundaries around your life to protect your heart, your energy, your calling, and the things that matter to you. Protect. Don't just live based on what people want you to do. Set boundaries around your life mm. and protect it. And Jesus was so good at that. Like I, I was just I almost chuckled at how many times scripture says, Jesus went off. Jesus went away. Jesus withdrew. We're like, where, where did he go? In the book of Mark, they're like looking for him. People are waiting for you. Where are you? And he is like, I'm out of here. I got to fill up. I have to stay mm. filled in order for me to do what God the Father has called me to do. I need to fill up. There was no guilt. It wasn't like, I'm so sorry, guys. I wish I, I'm so sorry. Okay, maybe I'll do that. And Okay, sure, I'll come and... I'm totally empty, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just go ahead and do this one last thing. You didn't get a hint of that in how he functioned. He was so confident because he was so aware that God's calling on his life was more important than anybody's obligation, than anyone's expectation. So he filled up shamelessly, wow. regularly. And it just makes us think, like, how seriously do I take the importance of being filled? Do I see it as a luxury or an actual necessity? Mm. And where am I going to fill up? What am I using to fill up? You know, Jesus spent so much time filling up at the, at the, in the presence of the Father. And I think we could learn a lot from that. Unfortunately, I think sometimes we look at being, getting filled up as a chore. Oh, I need to go pray. Right. But it should be a luxury. It should be like, hey, yes, we get to, you know. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. even see mm -hmm. it as like an additional outpouring. Like, oh, now I got to go give this to God after I already gave this to my kids and gave this to my husband. And rather than what it actually is, is right. receiving. I am here yep. to receive. That's oh, good. That is. But we talked about like the the physical implications of ignoring when we need that soul care. And you just, you know, mentioned that Jesus understood that he wouldn't be able to properly walk in his calling if he didn't take care of himself. I'm sure there are more spiritual repercussions in that even if we're not filling up. So let, like, let, let's dive deeper. What can really go wrong when we neglect that soul care, what all are we missing out on? You know, first of all, I don't think we can fully walk in what God has called us to walk in when we're empty. Yep. I think our level of effectiveness is directly correlated to our level of fullness. Because when I'm filled and I'm overflowing into the lives of the people around me, rather than when I'm empty... I am like desperately trying to get from them. And that's the irony of neglecting myself. You know, I, I even think about my relationship with my husband, for example. And I think about seasons where I have neglected myself. So we're afraid of self obsession. We don't want to get obsessed with ourselves. We don't, and I would agree with that. So what we do the opposite is self neglect. But interestingly enough, when you're neglecting yourself, you're empty, you're tired, you've got nothing left to give, you're irritable, and all you can think of is yourself in those moments. Like, think of you at your worst. You're the most selfish. It's like, I, I can't do anything for anyone because I am done. And I think about that even in marriage. Like, the emptier I am, 
the worse I'm going to be as a spouse. The emptier I am, the worse I'm going to be as a mom. I used to feel guilty taking the time and energy and effort that I needed to be filled when I had a baby. My first and second children were 20 months apart. And you feel kind of guilty, like, how do I do this? By the fourth, I'm like, I don't feel guilty. This is like impossible to do otherwise. <laughs> and I'm so unhealthy when I'm empty. And then they get an unhealthy mom, which then affects their life versus I do such a better job when I'm in alignment and I'm filled. I have better character, more patience, more joy. It, it's just, it just, it changes me. And so I think about the damage that we do, not just to ourselves, but the people around us when we don't take it seriously, the, the importance of staying filled up. And then let me add this. What about spiritually speaking, like the light that we're shining to the world? Yeah. Mm. You wouldn't have as much road rage if you were feeling <laughs> filled up and not in a rush, you know, <laughs> so you had more margin in your life. And Oops. the opposite of a light that shines brightly to this world, in my opinion, is a light that's been burnt out. Mm. You know, wow. I'm just going to stick my neck out and say, maybe take it even further. If you're not filled up and you're not hanging out with God where you know that you should, are there directives and things that God has for you you're not ready for? So he's not even talking to you about them. That right. could be a whole different trajectory for you. You're right. You're right. What you're able I'm to do. I'm pointing the finger myself here. <laughs> the, the, the distance you can go when your gas tank is filled versus the distance that you can go when it's less than a quarter tank is very different. Yep. Mm. You know, let's take it practical for a minute. The first rhythm of soul care is the rhythm of nourish. And it's funny because sometimes people are like, well, why did you start there? Because it's like nourish is about taking care of your physical body through nutrition, hydration, and movement. And we look at how Jesus did these things. There's three different chapters, a whole chapter on hydration. I mean, it's called, it might not be a demon. It might just be dehydration. Because sometimes <laughs> we neglect the basics. We don't eat. We don't drink. We've barely moved. We get to the end of the day. We're feeling miserable. We have a migraine. And we're like, this is spiritual warfare. When the enemy's like, actually, you did this all on your own. Like, I'm just sitting back <laughs> watching you self-sabotage. And so it's just even taking ownership in the practical things that don't feel spiritual at all sometimes. But they empower and equip us to to do spiritual things when i'm hydrated when i've i'm taking care of i'm fueling my body well when i'm moving i'm increasing my serotonin and dopamine when i exercise 20 minutes a day which is as effective as taking an antidepressant like there's things we can do wow. to aid in the call to go to judea and samaria and the ends of the earth and it's easier to do that when you've taken care of yourself mm -hmm. yeah I, I I love the whole idea of determining what is the most meaningful soul care rhythm for my personality. We've been touching on that. What's yours? I'm turning the camera a little bit. Yeah. So <laughs> the one that really stuck out the most to me as I was writing soul care is the rhythm of savor. And it's about being Ooh. present and fully enjoying and celebrating the life that I've been given here and now, like being present, wow. being here. I'm type A, mm -hmm. efficient. I like to get things done. I love a checklist. And yeah. it's easy for me to, to think about what's next, what's next. But the, the conviction to stay here and now, not what's next, but what's now. That's what I felt Jesus saying. Ooh. What's now? What is in front of you today? Where am I at right this moment? Where can you be present and undistracted and just savor and enjoy the life that you've been given here and now? We're in a stage of life where I mentioned I have four kids. I have a toddler, elementary schooler, middle schooler, and high schooler. Like Bless that. your heart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> bless our heart. Bless our marriage. Bless our home. Yeah. Um, yes. And just the gift 
to be able to just savor life with the difficulties. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm gonna be honest to you guys, I am coming to you in a season of deep suffering. And I share that mm-hmm. because Mike, you were so vulnerable to share earlier. So I'm not just talking about, oh, let's just enjoy life because it's so easy. I'm actually doing this as an act of rebellion against the hardships. God wants us Mm. to be present and to enjoy him and his gifts, even when life is hard and to, to, to celebrate and to see him in it and not just, okay, what's next? When is this going to be over? What's next? What do we, what's up ahead? But like what's right in front of me today. And so that was just Mm. such a meaningful chapter to write. And not only that, I feel like it sustained me through a really difficult season. I just keep going back to how can I enjoy, how can I savor even even life when it's difficult. Something that it's I've beautiful. wanted to get better at, especially with the, the passing of our daughter, you know, one of the things that, that I was unprepared for is guilt. And, mm-hmm. um, and I think it's because death is so final. I can't go back and undo anything. Yeah. Not that I was bad dad. People tell me I was a wonderful father. You know, you're more self-critical, but but at the idea that there were times where I just wasn't savoring and being present and being in the moment, because the more I think about it, guys, you're never in the future and you're never in the past. All we have right now is this moment right now that we're discussing. That's it. That's it. So I might as well figure out a way to enjoy it and uh, that can make life alone right there more enjoyable. I know. And not only that, now that you're in this new season where you are so susceptible to guilt, guilt will bring you back to the past. Yep. Worry will bring you to the future. So the Mm -hmm. only thing we have is the gift of, no, let me just stay here. Let me just stay here. Just right now. I know that even guilt is a distraction from the enemy to keep me from being right here, right now in God's presence with what he's given me today. Right. And that's how we know we can fight guilt with confidence because it's not the voice of God. Right. And neither is worry. Like God, Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Like, why are you there already? Stay here Mm. with me. And man, this yeah. takes so much like mental work. But I do feel like when we get this right, we stay filled. It's the worry and the guilt and all of these things that rob us from savoring light. It's like our bucket starts to leak, you know, in places that it was never intended to leak. Death is just so final. And when it happens, in an unexpected way, I think that that guilt can just begin to destroy you. When I lost my sister, all I could do was go back and think, if only I woulda, coulda, shoulda, and finally found myself one day just literally begging the Lord to tell me that she was completely healed. And he just did an amazing thing when I just finally let go. I mean, occasionally the woulda, coulda, shoulda start to try to creep back in. But the finality of an unexpected passing and the knowledge that there is no going back to fix anymore um, just can be so destructive. And so I just have to say thank you, Lord, for that knowledge that I just had to stop. And take that moment to just say, God, I just need to know she's in your arms now. Mm -hmm. I just need to know that no matter all of our mistakes and all of the woulda, coulda, shouldas that I'm bringing up right now, they're all healed. And um, that has brought me so much peace. I mean, there's still the grief of missing her, as you can see. Um, But wow, he's there and willing to provide that um that peace when we remember to stop Mm -hmm. (laughs) stop looking back stop wishing for a different future stop and live what you've got right now which is the memory i'm so grateful for her Mm -hmm. yeah here and now (laughs) is all we've got yep and that is why he is the i 
am. It's present tense. I'm right here. Mm -hmm. Not I was, I will be, <laughs> I am. Mm. And there's something wow. really powerful about that. That's amazing. I never thought of it quite like that. That's true. Either. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. He is, he is a present tense God. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Oh, that's the great good. I was. Remember him. I know. Exactly. That just doesn't sound as... Doesn't have the same doesn't ring. Doesn't ring a bell. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. No. What do you think mm. will be the difference, um, Deborah, if we all took this to heart? If Christians became more knowledgeable at their physical, emotional, mental health, and then being connected with God, what would the, what would the mm. turnout be? I think, first of all, let, let me start with the selfish answer. I think we'll be more content, mm -hmm. more joy-filled. Jesus says, I have come to give you life abundant. Another translation says, life in all of its fullness. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. It's for us. It's for our good. It's for our fullness. It's for our contentment. It's for our joy. It's for our peace. So it's for me, like when I am at my best because I am following in his lead, I am the predominant recipient of that joy. It's like that in and of itself is like, I want that. It yep. doesn't matter what's going on around me. I can still be filled. But then I think the secondary gain is the overflow into this world, into our families, into our children into our ministries, you know, and, and what God wants us to do, the great calling that he has on each of our life that he wants to equip us for. I want to fill you up so that you can pour out effectively. So I imagine it would change the world. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I think you're right. Be awesome. <laughs> Soul Care is the name of the book. Thank you, Deborah Folletta. Beautiful. Man. This is a nice picture in the back, too, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> what a great conversation. Yeah, it is. I had, yeah, like, a lot of mind-blown moments to today. To. I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. I feel like this was, like, group therapy. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. I, think, I was about to say, I think it might have been. <laughs> I'll just tell you that we cheat whenever we get a therapist on. Yeah. yeah that's all we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> so good. It was therapy all Aww. around. I feel blessed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, this is this has been really good. I think we all need this. We really do. I think mm -hmm. that's uh, we're pacifying ourselves. Yes, numbing ourselves. We don't want to deal with the real issues that are going on. We just need to run to God. Mm -hmm. Hang out with him. And uh, we find a lot of excuses not to do that. Yeah, we do, don't we? Yep. Mm -hmm. But I, I hope and pray that whoever picks up this book will be challenged to kind of assess, take inventory where they are leaking energy that God is like, nope, we got to fix that up. Um, I actually have a free quiz uh, at my website, deborahfileta.com slash soul care quiz. And you can go on and it takes like four or five minutes to answer a couple questions and it'll tell you which rhythm you're the weakest at. And I think that's a good place to begin <laughs> because imagine if that's your weakest rhythm, then you're likely leaking the most energy out of that specific place. So maybe start there. And then don't try to practice all the rhythms all at once. You don't want to burn out trying not to burn out, right? Like you got to <laughs> kind of like figure out where you're going to yeah. start, what's, which one's the most meaningful for you. The first five chapters, we unpack the why. Like why do you struggle with this? Let's get to fix that up first. And then we move into the six rhythms. And maybe the quiz can be helpful in giving you mm. a, a good head start. I think we should do it as a morning show. Or we're gonna, we should. Yeah. So that's uh, <laughs> F-I-L-E-T-A. So DeborahFileta.com is where to go for the quiz. That's awesome. And, and your if people, podcast is. Yeah, talk about your podcast. If people, people want to find podcast, it, how do they get there? Talk to Me. Yeah, the podcast is called Talk To Me. It's a hotline style show where people call in and we just talk about all kinds of sure. issues under the counseling umbrella. And we have these on-air sessions and just talk through things. So you can find more about that at the website as well, DebraFileta.com. You'll find the podcast tab. You can submit a question um, and just tune in. 
Cool. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that so it's live? Do you call people back or do they know when to call in? We call people back and then we, um, it's not live, it's, it's, it's just on air, meaning like we're recording. And You're recording a specific time. We're recording yeah. a specific time. We set up our, our, our hotline callers. Sometimes it's hotline callers. Other times it's on air sessions with notable people in the church, like mm -hmm. Chris Kane or Levi Lusco or we've had Louis Giglio on, Lisa Bevere. We just have on air sessions with people who are kind of courageous enough to open their heart on their journey of mental and emotional health because none of us are immune like we are all on a journey well if you want to open this mess again you could have Hankel Fritz and Friends on your podcast <laughs> I would love to oh, we obviously unpack. need it yeah exactly <laughs> oh that's funny well thank you for your time really appreciate it good stuff yeah.